Father, I love you, and I just want to come to you tonight and say thank you so much for giving to us the opportunity to be together and to be able to gather in your name, come under the authority of your word, and ask you, Lord, to fill us with your Holy Spirit and to speak to our heart. Thank you, Lord, that you never disappoint us, that you always have something for us, that your word speaks to each and every area of our life. You're an on-time God, and tonight for that we just say thank you. So, Lord, in our church family, we ask you to meet every need. Lord, for those in need of a touch, a physical touch, that you'd bring divine healing. For those who are suffering and grieving the loss of a loved one, that you'd minister and bring healing to their heart. Lord, we just pray for unspoken needs. We pray for burdens. We pray for those that are troubled, for those that are broken hearted tonight. I pray that you'd minister to every need. And so this evening, Lord, open your word to us. We say yes to you, and we say thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to do in and through us this evening for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen. amen. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, Uh, Before we continue reading and before we continue looking at these verses, you notice in the first four verses, which is what we talked about two weeks ago, he is laying out for us this idea of unity. And we spent a great deal of time talking about that two weeks ago and differentiating between unity and uniformity or unity and union. And uh, there is a world of difference in the two. Uh, Union and uniformity is a work of man or of flesh on the outside and it tries to conform people from the outside in. And unity is a work that is done on the inside, and it is a work of the Lord, and it is a work of the Holy Spirit, where He does His work from the inside out. And so, you know, if you take a couple, for example, a husband and a wife, and uh, they're saying, you know, we lack unity, or we need unity, or a family, and they say, you know, we need unity, and we really, preacher, help us, we really need some unity. Uh, This may sound a little oversimplistic, but it is truth, and that is... You know, the, let's just take, hey, you'd rather me talk about my wife and me. That's what you'd prefer. So, so let me do that. Uh, you take my wife and myself. Uh, how do we have unity? The closer I get to Jesus and the closer she gets to Jesus, the closer we get to each other. And, and the bottom line is you cannot solve uh, spiritual problems with fleshly solutions. In fact, all you'll do is make them worse. And so fleshly problems uh, have to be with spiritual solutions, biblical solutions, and if you throw more flesh at flesh, you're just going to have an absolute... I mean, you know, flesh begets flesh, and so if you try to solve fleshly problems, worldly problems with fleshly solutions, worldly solutions, you throw more flesh and more world at it, you're just you're, you're going to have some bad, 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 bad stuff. So the context here is, is, is unity. Who's listening to what I'm saying? Say amen. Uh, I'm going to have to tell this on a Sunday morning. Uh, I just thought, picking on my wife, uh, my wife's got this new uh, agenda, and I really need you to pray for me because we've got to work through it in our home. But uh, she's in choir, so I'm going to tell you, if I want her to know, I'll tell her, you mind your own business, amen? But she's got this new agenda. She just started this. She's done it two times in the past month. And uh, she she went to eat lunch with someone today. Here's the agenda, and and I probably ought not tell this because some of you are going to listen and run with it. But uh, I've told you before she has a mall ministry. Who knows what I'm talking about? Come on now, folks, lighten up. I'm having fun. Amen? And, and she's done this twice, Brother Chuck, in the past month. So today she was going to meet someone for lunch, and so she tells me, I walk in, she has a new pair of shoes on. <laughs> I said, oh, you got some new shoes? She goes, Jerry, it's the beatenest thing. She goes, I was going to meet someone for lunch and got in the restaurant and realized I wore my flip-flops. And I was so embarrassed. And so I had to run to the store and buy new shoes. I just had to. Now, a couple of weeks ago, she was... This has nothing to do with Philippians 2. Just hang on. We'll get there. Commercials, ladies and gentlemen. Amen? Amen. And so a couple of weeks ago, she was uh, meeting someone. Someone called and said, can you come over? And she said, Jerry, I wasn't dressed appropriately. What could I do? So I was close to the mall. I just stopped, bought a whole new outfit that went over to... And I'm like, I'm beginning to notice a pattern. Amen? So you pray for me. I need counseling on how to work through this um, trouble in my home. That's a Sunday morning story. Would you agree? Amen? Amen. All right, so let, let's, let's help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Amen. I appreciate it. So verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So the context is uh, unity. And by the way, I need you, Andy, to edit that out of the, uh, the live stream. Okay, so <laughs> guys, good night. I, I'm gone a week. I lose my mind. All right, let this mind be in you which was also in 
Christ Jesus. So just break this down. Let this mind, let, that means you've got to let it happen. You've got to cooperate. Uh, you've got to work with the Lord. Let this mind, the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? Well, verses 1 through 4 explains it. It's this spirit of unity that he's talking about. When he says in verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory and lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. So if the motto that's to be engraved upon our heart is we want to esteem others better than ourselves, what better example to follow than the example of Christ? After all, uh, the, the supreme example of the one who esteems others better than themselves is Jesus. The Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister to others. Who's thankful for that? So the supreme example for you and for me to follow of the one who explains to us and displays for us this mind, these characteristics, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, let this mind be in you, so it is the work of the Lord on the inside, not the work of man on the outside, that was also in Christ Jesus, who, and then he begins to explain Jesus in the mind of Christ, who being in the form of God... Uh, we'll get to it in a moment, but that word being is a present participle. And, and in the Greek New Testament, what that's explaining is continuous existence. So in other words, what he's trying to explain is the eternality of Christ. There never has been a time when He did not exist. There never will be a time when He will not exist. Jesus always has been. Jesus always will be. Jesus is God. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made Himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Paul is writing to these believers and the theme, as we've already seen, is unity. It is what sets the stage for this chapter is the first four verses where he lays out for us the foundational principles of the unity in Christ and of our example now being explained to us in the Lord Jesus. So let's just just dive into it and let's study it. He, He begins by laying out for you and for me the attributes of Christ. So as we start thinking about the mind of Christ and What is the mind of Christ? How is the mind of Christ displayed and revealed in in us and through us? Uh, What is the mind of Christ? Who is Christ? Who are we talking about? And so he begins verses 5, 6, and 7 by laying out for us the attributes of Christ. So he says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Then he begins verse 6, who, and that is modifying Christ Jesus that is introduced to us in verse 5. So Paul is explaining to this church who Christ really is, and he's given us a description of Jesus. I think you'd have to agree with me. All of the descriptions in the Bible of Jesus are wonderful. Amen? But boy, what a great one this is that explains to us who Jesus is. Look with me about uh, tonight the attributes of Christ. What are some of his attributes that Paul highlights in these verses? His eternality, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, to be equal with God. Who being, it's indicating continuous existence. Who literally being from the beginning. Now what is he trying to say? He's trying to say, uh, let me put it to you this way. Before Bethlehem was, Jesus was. Now there are a lot of people that believe, uh, you know, Bethlehem was the beginning. No, understand, uh, that was the incarnation. God taken upon himself a human body. And, and, and this is not Christmas, but my goodness, we can talk about this 365 days a year. Why was he born of a virgin? Why did he take on a human body? Because God cannot die, and God took upon himself human flesh in order that he could dwell among us, in order that he would die. Why? To pay for our sin. Uh, what a great, great, great message. Amen? Amen. Uh, now, there were, um, there were a lot of people that taught this. You know, the interesting thing that you've always got to keep in mind... There's no new thing under the sun. And false doctrine today, you think it's new, it's not new. If you'll trace it back and study it, it always gets repackaged every so many years. It may have a new name, new title, may have a new bow. But I'm going to tell you, uh, the devil, the devil is always about spreading the same lies. You go back to Bible days. Let me tell you what there were people who thought uh, during those days. The Gnostics, for example. Uh, They taught that Jesus was a mere human... And uh, what happened, you remember I preached not long ago, uh, two weeks ago, 
on how Jesus was baptized. Heavens were open. Spirit descended upon Him a dove. Do you remember that? And so there are people that taught in Bible days, and guess what? There are still people that believe this today, that Jesus was just a regular baby boy that was born, regular human, and that God took Him, and when He was baptized, the Spirit descended on Him, and that's when He became God. And then on the cross, He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's when the Spirit left Him, and He ceased to be God, and He was nothing more than a mere human that God chose to use. Whew. Okay. Preacher, what do you think about that? There's a good word for that. Baloney. It, it, it's, it, it, is, it is damnable. It is heretical. It is from hell. It is inspired by the devil. Because I'm just telling you, Jesus was not just some little ordinary baby boy. Jesus is, Jesus was, Jesus always will be God. Period. And He did not cease to be God even though He wrapped Himself in human garb and human flesh in order to walk here on this earth and dwell among us. And so when we talk about the attributes of Christ, His eternality, who being, it is a present participle, and He is saying He's always been. Jesus always has been. Uh, we don't have time to go into this tonight, but you get over to the Old Testament and you have what uh, will be called a Christophany. What is a Christophany? A Christophany is a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ. So for example, let me just the first time uh, the angel of the Lord is mentioned is in Genesis 18, and he appeared to Hagar. Now not every time the angel of the Lord is referenced in the Old Testament does it reference Christ, uh, pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ, but many times it does. Uh, for example, do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Hey, you better remember. We just got through talking about this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They got thrown into the fiery furnace. Yes or no? And you remember King looked in. He said, I threw in three. Now I see four. Or uh, there, There's four. Three come out. There's the fourth like the same. Okay, I'll, I'll get it right in a minute. He looked in and he saw the fourth and he said, He is like the Son of God. Who, who in the world was that? That was Christ Jesus before Bethlehem ever was. Hundreds and hundreds of years before He was born of a virgin. What, what, what's the point? Jesus did not begin at Bethlehem. Christ always has been. What happened at Bethlehem? That's when God took upon Himself human flesh and was born of a virgin to come. Why? So that He could identify with us, so that He could represent us, so that He could understand us, so that today when you get on your knees and you say, Lord, no one understands what I'm going through. Stop it. Stop it. Because Jesus was in all points tempted just like you have been, just like I have been. And there's nothing you're going through, nothing you will ever go through that He's not gone through times a hundred and He's done it without sin and He can give you victory. Amen? Amen. So what's Paul saying? Paul is saying in the attributes of Christ, he's talking about His eternality. Then verse 5 and 6, he talks about His deity. He says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, the anointed one. Verse 6, who being in the form of God. Now, when he talks about that word, form of God, he doesn't mean Jesus just looked like God. You know, some people would have said, Jesus just looked like God more than any other man. He resembled God more. That's not what this means. The word form is the permanent, constant being of a person, and it is the inward essence that Christ expressed being the very nature and character of God. What's he saying? He is God. Who being in the form of God, Jesus was... You know, Jesus was not just like God more than any other man. Uh, Jesus was not 80% God, 85% God, 90% God, 95% God, 99% God. He wasn't even 99.99999. He was, he is God. And that's a big deal. Uh, because you say, well, preacher, it doesn't matter. Oh, it does matter. Uh, you say, well, Jesus is a God. No, Jesus is God. You say, well, I mean, you know, this church, all y'all ever talk about is Jesus. Thank you for the compliment. And y'all sing about Jesus a lot around here. You bet you. Come on back. We're going to do some more this Sunday on Mother's Day. Amen. You talk about him a lot. You better believe it. Can't we talk about something else? What else is there to talk about? I mean, in him we move, we live, we have our being. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is before our problem, after our problem. He's the first, the last, the alpha, omega, the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. I'm about to get happy. Amen. I mean, he is the all in all. Yes or no? And so who is this Jesus? We're talking about this mind of Christ. Who is he? His eternality, He always has been. His deity, He is God. He is co-equal with the Father. He is co-existent with the Father. He is co-eternal with the Father. He possesses all of the qualities and attributes of God. 
uh, when the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters, and God said, let there be. I mean, you see the Trinity from the very first page of the Bible. You see God the Father, you see God the Son, God said... Uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All were things were created by Him. That's what John tells us. Well, but when you get over to Genesis 1, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And John 1 tells us, All things were created by Him. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have always been. Then you read down into Genesis 1, and it says, Let us make man in our own image. Well, who was God talking to when He said, Let us make man in our own image? He didn't make man in the image of an angel. I know some of you think you are an angel, but I promise you, you're not. Amen? Amen? You say, now preacher, wait a minute. My husband's an angel. Sure he is. He's always up in the air and he's always harping about something. Amen? <laughs> yeah, buddy. Come on now, Miss Debbie. That's a good one. Okay, now. Now, now. Now, what's the point? When, when God said, let us make man in our own image, so in the image of God He created man, who was He talking to? That's a conversation between the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Y'all all still awake? Say Amen. Oh, whoo, I could really get off on a wreck. We could go till next week on this. Do you know man's a trichotomy? What in the world does that mean? We're made in the image of God. What does that mean? God is a trinity. What does it mean we're made in the image of God? Does it, we know we don't. I mean, it doesn't mean God is a spirit. So it doesn't mean you look in a mirror and that's what God looks like. That's not, that does, that's not what that means when it says we're made in the image of God. And so man is a trichotomy. So we are, are y'all all awake? We have a body. We have a soul. We have a spirit. Amen? Y'all all have a body? Hello? You okay? Amen? Y'all want to keep going or you want me to stop? I mean, you have a soul? Okay, and your, your, your soul is made up of uh, intellect, emotions, and will? Right? Okay, now y'all going to call me a heretic when I say this. You know, trees, plants, it has bodies. Right? Animals, they have bodies. Now, I'm going to tell you, now hold on. I'm going to tell you, listen to this. You ready? Does, does a dog have a soul? Before you argue, do they have an intellect? Yeah. I've met some pretty smart dogs. Yeah. 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 Do they have emotions? Yeah. I, our little small poodle, I can just look at him. He cries. <laughs> do they have a will? <laughs> do they have a will? You better believe I know I have... Okay. I have been around some dogs, listen, a whole lot better than some teenagers. Amen? Right or not? Our little small poodle stop, stops. I mean, I, I, it is the most obedient dog I've ever met. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. So to that extent, and before you go out and say I'm preaching heresy, listen, to that extent, animals have a soul. But let me tell you what they don't have. And let me tell you what makes mankind distinct from all other creation. They don't have a spirit. God said to Adam, uh, in the day you eat, you're going to surely die. And he immediately died spiritually. Yes or no? He lived hundreds of years. He didn't die physically, but he died immediately spiritually. And what's Pentecost? Pentecost is God reinstating to man what was forfeited when man sinned. Because when man sinned, Adam was devoid of the Spirit. Boy, boy I... I, I don't know how I got off on Genesis. Y'all got to forgive me, man. We need to go through Genesis one day. Amen? Amen? God created man, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living spirit. God put his spirit in man's spirit. And that's what Adam, man, that's when he came alive. Are you listening? That, that's what made him distinct. That's what separated him from all of the creation. Then he sinned and he forfeited it and he walked in spiritual darkness. And we're born sinners. And I'm telling you, we're born with a spirit that's dead. Amen. And I'm telling you, someone that's spiritually dead... You can try every which way you want to to talk to them about spiritual things, but until their spirit is awakened, quickened, made alive, they'll never understand. They have intellect, they have emotions, they have will, but their spirit is not in tune with God. So, such was the case for you, and such was the case for me before I was born again. But when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came in and took up residence in my spirit, awakened my spirit, quickened my spirit, and hallelujah. Now I've got something that no animal has, that no plant has, that no whale has. And that is, I have the ability to commune with a holy God. And that is a great gift that is given to one by the Spirit when they're made alive in Christ. Amen? Amen. Ask me how I got all. I can tell you how I did. I can go back and connect the dots. Because we were made in the image of God. Why? Because God is a trinity. 
And man is a trinity, and there's three parts, and you better understand that. And you had better understand, you can talk to your blue in the face to someone about spiritual things, but until the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of them and makes them alive, and they have an appetite for spiritual things, you, you may as well talk to a fence post. And we better learn that we win this battle on our knees, and we've got to do spiritual warfare, and the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of those that believe not, and until those blinders are removed, you're not... Listen, you can't just teach the Bible... In a, in a purely academic setting and, and just learn it to be armed and on guard to win more battles. You better learn the Bible in the Spirit because it is the Spirit of God that makes it alive in you. The letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. Now, let's close all those browsers. Can y'all stay with me a few minutes? Amen? Amen. Woo, we may need to take a break tonight. All right, let's close all those browsers. What's, what's he talking about? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Jesus is as much God is God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He is co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. God is a trinity, and it's all through the Bible. I just wanted to go back to Genesis and point out just a couple of examples. And, and, and the stamp of God being a trinity is all over us. It is all over humanity. It's over everything. Are you listening? Y'all want me to keep going? Just another, just, okay. Everything under heaven has order. You want to talk about something that will get folks mad. Okay, here we go. Uh, every time you see the Trinity, it's always God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Always. There are no exceptions. And Jesus said, I don't just speak on my own. I speak only those things He tells me. And the Holy Spirit said, I don't speak on my own. I only speak that which glorifies Jesus. Well, wait a minute. Because in our day, this is what we'd say. You know, well, the Holy Spirit, you're not less God than Jesus or God the Father. No, but they all have a different role. That's God's order. I didn't make that plan. You didn't make that plan. Everything under heaven has order. Everything under heaven has order. So you break that down in the home. It's always the husband, the wife, the children. Well, I'll, well, there you go. There you go. And the overwhelming majority of homes in America today are governed by the children. Amen. To, 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 amen. Come on now. You may as well just you may as well just go ahead and say amen. It's the truth. And uh, you know what? Uh, weak, weak, weak daddies. Weak, weak spiritual men. And I'm just telling you, uh, to the precious ladies, you know, <laughs> the men that would say, well, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, to the men that say, well, my wife won't follow me, you cannot follow a parked car. Right. And so you've got to be the spiritual leader. right? Yes or no? Come on, amen. amen. Just, just get up, dude, lead. I mean, come on. You know, know the Bible, pray, lead your family, talk about the things of God, and you love sports, and that's good. You love to hunt, that's good, but man, come on, Jesus. Amen? Amen. So everything under heaven has order, and the Trinity is seen all throughout creation. And here in this verse, he is talking about his eternality. That means he always has been. He didn't just start at his baptism. He didn't end at Calvary. He, he's always been. Amen? Amen? All right. His deity, he is Christ, his humanity. Verse 7. So he says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. We'll talk more about that in a minute. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. That right there is Christmas. Who gets it? That's the incarnation. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's a good Christmas verse right there. It says, He took upon him the form of a servant. That's his humanity. He was made in the likeness of man. So this eternal God who always has existed, became man. 100% God, 100% man. To put it another way, he was as much man had he never been God. He was, I mean, real. And he was as much God had he never been man. The hypostatic union, the God-man, 100% God, 100% man. And the incarnation was the act of the preexistent, eternal Son of God voluntarily taken upon him a human body, you and I will never understand it. I heard this analogy years ago, and it doesn't even do its justice. Uh, I heard someone give an analogy of, if you look at an ant pile, now where I come from, there's fire ants. And we got them around here. And they're full of demons. And everyone said amen. <laughs> and so you look at a big ant pile, an ant mound, and you say, you know, I want to I wanna understand those ants, and I want to save those ants, and... And I want to associate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be born an ant. 
so that I can live with them and I can understand them and then I can die for them. And that doesn't even do it justice to explain the humility of what God endured to put himself through to dwell among us. We're talking about the one that created all the water by just saying, let there be, and then he said, I thirst. We're talking about the one who created everything, and yet he experienced pain. They plucked his beard, they beat him, they mocked him, they spat upon him. He was bruised, barely recognizable. I mean, we'll never understand it. Man, what a Savior. Amen? He was made in the likeness of men. And so what is he talking about? The attributes of Christ. Secondly, let's move on, verse 6 through 8, the attitude of Christ. So having explained to us about unity, the first four verses, and having revealed to us who Jesus really is, he now begins to outline for you and me the attitude of Christ. He's using Christ as the example, and he explains the attitude of Christ. So let this mind be in you, okay? Well, what is it? How will we know? What is it? Here it is. Number one, it's identified with selflessness. Not selfishness, selflessness. So he says in verse 6, Who being in the form of God did not think it robbery to be equal with God. So what is he saying? Jesus is saying, and Paul is saying about Jesus, even though he was God, he did not consider equality with God as something that should be held on to. In other words, the fact that he was God was not something that he clung to. He did not think of himself. He was willing to put others First, so the attitude of Christ, the mind of Christ in you and me is being selfless. That's the attitude of Christ. When we put others before ourselves. Now, who in the room would agree with me that's not natural because of our sin nature? Who in the room would agree? All right, well, just a few of you. It's going to take me a little longer to preach on this. If y'all had just all admitted it, I'd have moved on to the next point. You had your chance too late. All right. So, so let's just tell, let's, let's ask the question another way. Come on, folks. God, I got a tough crowd on Wednesday night. My goodness gracious. Who in the room would admit that occasionally you just struggle with being selfish? Okay, well, now there we go. Okay, well, y'all, y'all like the negative better than the... Uh, so we're, we're selfish, right? We're, we, we are. Yes or no? We're selfish. Uh, let me ask you this question. You take a couple of kids, uh, take two, two kids, same age, and you go buy them some, you know, <laughs> French fries. And, and because we have all kind of people in here, um, maybe broccoli for others. But, I mean, you know, for those of you that don't like French fries. So, you know, you take French fries, you give this one two French fries, you give that one three fries. And we're talking small, tiny kids. This one gets two fries, that one gets three fries. What does the one with two fries do? What does the one with two? Does the one with two say thank you for the fries? Or does the one with two pitch a royal fit that the other one got three? Okay, babies. And, 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 and guess what happened? Guess what would happen? The one that got two, if you walked over and gave them two more and now they got four, they'd be perfectly fine. Yeah. Yes or no? no? Be perfectly fine that you gave them more than the other one. Then the other one would pitch a fit. They got right or wrong. Amen. Mm-hmm. Y'all listening? Uh, I've got a story to tell about that with Bill Britt. If y'all will remind me when he's here in a couple of weeks preaching, I'm gonna t- it's an embarrassment to him, and I would be so glad to tell it. And, and uh, I mean, you know, I mean, God forbid that I would take joy in someone else's misfortune. But if you'll remind me, I'll, I'll tell it. Now, now, what's the point? I mean, we're just, that's our sin nature, folks. We're inherently selfish. You do not have to teach a baby to be selfish. And you know what? As we grow up, my age and older, all of us, we're all that way. That is, our, that is our fallen nature. And the opposite is the mind of Christ, which is to be selfless. I, I heard someone a long time ago, I, I, I really think this is a big deal, a very successful businessman who said, if you want to really test the character of an employee, don't give them responsibilities, give them privileges. And watch how they use those privileges and you'll know their real character. Because someone that has the mind of Christ will use their privileges to put others first. Someone that's selfish will use it all for themselves. You see, the issue is Jesus is talking to you and me about the mind of Christ and about being selfless. Now, we all just admitted we're selfish. So I think we all just admitted why we need the mind of Christ. Now, you take two people and get them married together and they're both selfish, and they are. 
And there's no amount of marriage counseling that will get it out of them. There's not enough workbooks. There's not enough discipleship classes. Y'all even learned your love language, still fighting. <laughs> and even the love language is, is used by most of us selfishly. Because even, even love languages, most of the time what you do for your spouse is what you want. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm doing this for you. That's what you want. That's not what they want. And so we, we're just selfish creatures. Come on now. We're about to have a fight in this room tonight. We're about to, I'm supposed to be helping your marriages, and we're stirring them up, all right? He, he, so he's telling us the mind of Christ is being selfless. You've got to put yourself to the side. Secondly, what do we learn about Jesus? He was a servant. He made himself, verse 7, of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. He emptied himself. Literally, it is a phrase that means pouring water out of a glass. He emptied himself. He took upon him the form of a servant. Jesus never came to this earth with a lot of fanfare. Jesus came to this earth to serve. Where did he begin his ministry? He inaugurated his ministry. Watch this. His first miracle was in a little place called Cana. And it's out of the way place, right? I mean, Jesus... You know, Jesus didn't come to New York City and, and parades and fanfare and, and signs and, you know, don't you love uh, election season? I mean, there's just thousands of signs. And, and if that's not enough, when you show up to the polls, they're all politic in there, you know? As if I, I need, oh, just leave me in. Let me get in. I just take off running to, to get in. I think my mind's made up before I get there. I think most of y'all know that. But anyway, the form of a servant. Jesus is teaching us that the mind of Christ is about being a servant. Who in the room would agree serving is not something that comes natural for us? Why do we need the mind of Christ? To serve. What else? He was willing to sacrifice, verse 8. He emptied himself, he became a human, he used that body to serve... And then the Bible says in verse 8, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus became obedient unto death. He died on the cross. The attitude of Christ. Jesus was not only willing to serve, he was willing to sacrifice. You know, a lot of times we'll say, I'll serve as long as it does not cost me anything. Right? Um, you remember the church of Ephesus? Jesus said, I know your works, how you have love, you have patience. For my name's sake, you've labored, you've not fainted. Uh, what, what does he tell them? You're laboring, but you've left your first love. Amen? Amen? Do you know you can labor and not love? Now, you can't love without laboring, but you can labor without love. Who gets it? Amen. Let me say it again. Um, if you love, you'll labor. So you, you can't love without labor, but you can labor without love. And when you get to the point where you're just going through the motions like a robot, and don't not, the, the, guys, I'm your pastor. It's kind of expected that I get to church on Sunday. Amen. And everyone said, amen. you know, amen? amen? And I'm not being silly. I have to constantly search my heart and say, Lord, would I still come? if I wasn't expected to come. I mean, it's kind of a big deal if the preacher skips church. Yeah. Come on, amen. I mean, what's wrong with the preacher? He just doesn't want to come. He found something on TV. He wants to watch it. Now, look, I don't mean this to be ugly. A lot of you can get away with it. I can't. Right or not? Good show on TV Sunday morning. Didn't want to miss it. I mean, you know, he... So I've got to constantly say, Lord, search my heart. I want to, you know, I want to know that I'd be here even if I didn't have to be here. Amen. Amen? Look, you can labor and not love. And the Lord is trying to tell us that the mind of Christ is one. Watch this. He was willing to pay a price. Someone said ministry that costs you nothing will accomplish nothing. Another way to say the same thing is if you want blessing, you've got to have bleeding. If you want a crown, there's got to be a cross. There's a price to pay. That doesn't mean we're paying for our salvation. That's not what this is saying. But I'm just telling you, the attitude of Christ is you'll serve people even if it costs you. 
Not what's the least I can do to get by. I want to go the extra mile. Who's ever heard this? There's no traffic jam on the second mile. You'll never, ever, ever, ever have a crowd on the second mile. Second mile Christians, that's what we ought to be. Go the extra mile. Okay, let me give you the third thing. We're almost done. Who's still listening? Say amen. Amen. The authority of Christ, verses 9 through 11. So we've seen the attributes, the attitude. Now look at the authority, verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. So he begins to talk about Jesus dying on the cross, but now notice the result. My goodness, this is good stuff. Now folks, look, right here, right here. Some of you need to get your amen or fixed, and you need to, you need to get excited. Amen? amen? Hey, that church I preached at this weekend. But I think I scared some people. Who knows what I'm talking about? I mean, <laughs> there were some scared looks like this guy's crazy. He's going he's gonna to go. All right, look. The authority of Christ, verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. He is exalted. Who's thankful for that? Amen? Amen. You see, the cross was not the end of it all. There's more to the story. Is anyone thankful for that? And, and notice he's been exalted. Has highly exalted him. That means to raise to the highest position. He has been highly exalted. He's been raised to the highest position. Meaning, there is no one over or above Jesus. Amen. There is no one exalted any higher than Jesus. He's the one. God also hath highly exalted him and given him, granted to him, bestowed upon him a name. That word name means authority. Does that make sense? Uh, I should not go there, but I'm going to go there. Folks, there's a lot of folks get just stirred up. You know, um, when the Bible says, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, I mean, there's just folks get nervous about that, get upset about that, get mad about that. Get uh, Listen to me. The word name means the authority. You are being baptized in the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? That's what the name name means. So when he says he's given him a name, he's given him an authority that is above, that word means over and above and superior to every other name. There is no name worthy to be whispered in the same sentence as the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? He is highly exalted. He's extolled, verse 10 and 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. At the authority of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee should bow, that word means bend, in submission and subjection and acknowledgement. Every knee, the word every, guess what it means? The word every there means each one without distinction, each one without exception. Every knee. Now let me just ask you this, what does every knee mean? Does anyone know what it means? What does it mean? It means every single solitary knee is going to bend and is going to bow. And then he says, of things in heaven and things in earth, and that verse 11, every tongue. Every means each one without distinction, each one without exception. Every tongue, that is the word ethnos, ethnicity. Every tongue, every language group should confess, should fully agree, should fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is going to come a day, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll allow me to preach for just a moment on this beloved Wednesday night. There is going to come a day when each and every single solitary knee and every single solitary tongue, not every one save one, not most, everyone, each one, Warren Buffett, George Soros, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Jerry Chaddick, Chuck Fuji, you, Stalin, Hitler, every, every knee. And there's going to come a day when every tongue, Nebuchadnezzar, every tongue, Every single solitary one is going to confess, is going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is going to happen. You say, I'll never do it. You most certainly will. Well, all, you, it's going to happen. Now, you've got a choice. You can do it now, and that's salvation. Or you can do it then, and that's judgment. It make a whole lot more sense. You're listening to what I'm telling you. To settle out of court. You don't even have to go to court. You can settle out of court. Are you guys listening to what I'm saying? And confess it and acknowledge it and admit it now. Hallelujah, the authority of Christ. Let me then now draw these applications and we're going to be done and go home. The application is let this mind, let this attitude be in you. Uh, What's some of the points that we need to draw from this lesson? Number one, in you, means the Lord does His work on the inside. 
Religion always does its work on the outside. Religion is always a set of rules that tries to get people whipped into shape. Uh, amen? amen? Y'all remember years ago, um, I used to remember going to church and hearing preachers talk about men with long hair. Who in the room remembers that? You know, uh, now when I see a man with longer hair, I kind of admire it. <laughs> I have a little habit when I see a teenager. You know, they got these mullets back now. You know what I mean? Yep. And, and, and I never understood why they were in to begin with years ago. I don't know. Whatever, whatever you do, you. Okay? Um, but whenever I see a teenager in our church and they got a full, thick head of hair, you, you see those boys, I mean, boys today, <laughs> boys today, spend more time on their hair than girls. I mean, it's, it's exhausting, I'm telling you. And, uh, you know, these young men, they got those bangs down to here, you know, and they, they do this. You know? <laughs> who, know, who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. Amen? <laughs> I, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Amen. I mean, anytime I see, anytime I see a teenage boy in our church and they got that, hair, I, I go up to him and I'm like, "Listen, is there any advice that you could give a man like me on how to grow hair?" And they always just look at me, like number one, they can't believe I'm talking to them. <laughs> number two, they can't believe I'm asking. And number three, they don't know what to say. And one of them the other day just finally looked at me and said, "There's no hope for you, preacher. There's no hope." <laughs> And there's not. I mean, amen. And there's not. And I got to be careful how I say that because then there's someone that will run up and say, oh, there's an oil for that, so we don't need to go there, all right? But come on now, don't get mad. Oh, my goodness gracious. So years ago, you know, people preach on, you know, you should not do this, this, this. And I, I get it. I, I, I get it. I mean, whether anyone likes this or not, there's just some things that as Christians we don't do. Amen? Amen? But a conviction is something that's in your heart. You remember Daniel purposed in his heart. And if it's not in your heart, you'll change depending on what crowd you're with. So don't call it a conviction if it's not in your heart. Does that make sense? And that means you're going to live it when it's just you and no one else is there. Because it's the right thing to do and it's biblical. And always make sure, man, I'm telling you, I'm with you 100% if it's biblical. But if it's your opinion of the Bible that's where you said you got your conviction from. No, 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 no. We're not going to die on that one. Amen? Yep. Now, what am I trying to say? What I'm simply trying to say is this. Get your hair cut short. I get one every three weeks, whether I need to or not. And I'm going to let you on a little secret. My wife cuts my hair. And you know why? Because I can get it done at midnight. I don't have to answer 175,000 questions, and I can just sit down and get it done, and I don't have to pay her. Amen? <laughs> Until she buys shoes, but that's another sermon for another day. Okay, so <laughs> get you a woman can cut your hair and cook, man. I'm telling you, you'll be in, you'll be in for a treat. But nevertheless, <laughs> I mean, you know, I couldn't have long hair if I wanted to. And, and I, I, I'm not telling you don't have convictions. I'm just telling you, if you clean the outside of the cup up and you never walk in the Spirit and let the Lord clean you up on the inside... You may have good man-made religion, but I'm telling you, you're going to be full of dead men's bones. Amen. And, and the Lord says the mind of Christ is in you. It's not outside, it's inside. And Jesus cleans us up from the inside out. Amen? Amen? So the first principle as we close is this. The mind of Christ is developed from the inside. Secondly, you've got to cooperate. Let this mind be in you. Don't fight the Lord. Let Him have His way. What's the point? Am I selfless? No, I'm not. Do I think of others more than I think of myself? Not naturally. Am I a servant? It's not natural. Am I willing to sacrifice? It's not always easy. Let the mind of Christ develop in you. And when you let Him develop in you, He'll make you a servant. He'll make you selfless. He'll cause you to sacrifice. He'll give you joy. And I'm telling you, listen, it won't be something that you have to work up. It'll be a joy to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. 
let this mind be in you. What's the point? What's the point of Philippians? The one word he mentions 19 times, joy. You want to have joy? Let, let the mind of Christ develop in you. Let him have his way in you. Quit fighting him. Just, Jesus, I trust you. And when you and I do that, we'll have a whole lot of joy in our lives. When we try to do it our way, we'll never walk in joy. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let me pray for us. Father, we love you and we thank you for letting us be here tonight. We thank you for the word. We thank you for always speaking to our heart. I thank you for these people. I thank you for what they mean to me and what they mean to your kingdom. And I pray in Jesus' name that you'll minister to every heart. You'll encourage every heart. You'll meet every need for your glory. We love you and we honor you and we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.